Welcome back guys, this is Automotive Anonymous. That's a 2024 Subaru Outback Wilderness. And I have seven gripes or concerns I need to share with you if you're considering the Outback Wilderness. Or if you have one, you're probably gonna relate to a lot of this list. But if you're new to the platform, you can tell it's a 2024. By the way that it is, it has the boot prints on the refresh cladding. Anyways, this isn't a typical review of course because I've already done one of those over a month ago if you're interested in that video. But my experience, my opinions are formed by driving over a dozen of these on my channel and having owned a 2022 Outback Wilderness for over two years. So we're gonna go through the seven gripes and then at the end, I have a little surprise for you guys if you stick around. I'm gonna show you a glimpse of my own garage and a little project that I have going on that will be finished before I upload this video. So we'll time travel and then we'll time travel back if you're interested in seeing that and you'll see how it's tied potentially to this and what we talk about. Anyways, let's dive right in with this review. And before anyone heads to the comments section of this video, keep in mind, I do think that the Outback Wilderness overall is a phenomenal vehicle. I wouldn't still own one if I didn't. Subaru got a lot of things right with this, and it's a vehicle that has brought in a lot of people to Subarus that I think otherwise wouldn't have bought one, myself included, at least to the Outback trim level. But it's not perfect, nor is any car, and it does have some legit concerns. And here they are. The first and biggest gripe I have on the list is the CVT. I honestly think that Subaru makes a pretty darn good CVT, especially compared to some of the other auto manufacturers. But you can't rebuild those, you have to replace them. That seems to be the general consensus online. And when you do, it costs eight to nine grand if it's not covered under warranty. No one wants to pay 20% of the vehicle's new value just to replace the transmission if Subaru didn't do a good job on it. Again, I don't hear a lot of concern on the forums. I honestly hear about more automatic Chevy truck end transmissions and other brands having transmission concerns than I do on Subaru. They do, most of them are covered under warranty. What gives me a little bit of peace of mind though is that the Subaru Ascent, which is the biggest, heaviest platform, which is also rated to tow 1500 pounds more than this, uses the same transmission. So it shouldn't be very stressed when you're using it in the Outback application, but it's still a concern and a pretty big one. My second issue is the auto start stop system. When you fire up the vehicle, it takes just a second or two before the screen will let you turn it off. Thankfully, it quickly becomes muscle memory. But you have to do that every single time. It won't permanently stay off. You can pay about $100 and get an OBD2 port down here plug-in that will permanently disable it. But you shouldn't have to. Subaru, maybe if they designed it to be more integrated well with the engine, so it felt more natural and not so shaky when it turns on and off, I might not have the same concern I do, but it just feels like an afterthought. My third issue is actually the adaptive cruise control with the iSight cameras. This is the Gen 3 system with the two cameras. The Gen 4 system has the extra camera in the middle. The Touring XT Outback actually has that. So what my concern is, is even though it's overall a pretty good system and it can keep you in your lane, sometimes go around pretty wide corners without bumping you out, there's other moments where I'm going basically straight down the road and it'll bump me, then it'll bump me more aggressively, and then it could bump you all the way out. So you really can't fully trust the system. You gotta be careful, especially with how sensitive the steering rack is. You barely turn the wheel and the direction of the vehicle starts to change. My fourth issue is the miles per gallon that a lot of people get with this platform. I've actually gone as good as 34 on a tank before and probably as bad as maybe 22 before if it was all city all around town. These engines and transmissions, the combination has to work really well in a good partnership to actually get good mileage. And anything outside of those ideal parameters and your mileage is gonna tank. So basically, you should have your oil temp close to 200, which only happens once you've been driving around for a while, not for a lot of short sprints or commutes. Make sure you're not overfilling the gas tank because the charcoal canister with the sensors that it has for emissions, it will get flooded, it'll get messed up, and it'll read incorrectly and throw too much fuel at the car if it's over full, so don't do that. Additionally, highway speeds are where this shines, so between 60 to 72 in my experience. If you go much more than that, it's not linear road and wind resistance, it's magnified quite a bit, and your MPG is really gonna drop. Just idling for as much time as we have, you can see it's getting under 10 miles per gallon right now. So these are finicky, they can get really good MPG, but you have to be very conservative and very consistent in those parameters. Otherwise, they just don't do that well. My fifth issue is the infotainment screen. It's 11.6 inches, it looks pretty good, but it's not an iPad, it's not a Tesla screen. It doesn't work nearly as well. It's slow, it's laggy at times, and the quality just isn't fantastic. Thankfully, there was that software update last year, so some of the features don't pull up a second screen, like the heated seats and stuff like that, but they really need to remove the HVAC system from the screen. Having everything dependent in that with very little control outside of it 
just stinks. I don't like that. I don't think it's safer to be distracted by the screen while you're trying to go down the road. Issue number six is the camera quality, which I do apologize. We have the factory screen protector on this, so there is a little bit extra glare. But if we go into reverse, the trajectory lines do move, which is nice. But you can see that it's only horizontally about a third the whole height of that 11.6 inch screen. And it's not very great quality. It's pretty grainy. And then if we go to the front facing 180 degree camera, it's basically the same and it can only take up the same size and proportions on the overall basically foot diagonal screen. So it does an okay job. I'm glad it's there. I just wish that it was better. My seventh and final issue with the Outback Wilderness is even though it stands apart from all the other wildernesses, there are so many of them where I'm from in the Pacific Northwest that they all do start to look the same. I wish Subaru would give us more options, more parts from the parts bin that they have on other Subarus, especially where they're basically all the same global platform. I of course wish we had the six speed manual transmission option on the Wilderness and maybe the base trim level. I feel like those are the ones that people would really like because it's more of the enthusiast one. I also wish we had different wheels and tires that we could pick for this because they looked really good at the start, but honestly, they're all starting to look the same. There's other little details like that, cosmetic things and, you know, replaceable, swappable parts that you can do in the aftermarket world, of course. I just wish Subaru from the factory gave us more options because a lot of people bought the Wilderness to not have to mess with it because it already looks like it's aftermarket modded. Anyways, that's my list. What's yours? Comment below. Otherwise, we're going to time travel to my garage and I'll show you what I've been working on. Here's my own 2022 personal Outback Wilderness, which spends most of its days just chilling in the driveway. And then the 2023 Miata Club. It's filthy, it's full of bugs because it drives several hundred miles a week as I go to my full-time job, but it's happy, it's smiling, and I really appreciate its demeanor. But the real reason I have you in the garage today is because this morning I had a 240 volt NEMA 1450 plug installed. These can be used for things like a dryer or an oven, but more commonly they're involved in level two EV charging. So I'm not saying that I'm going straight to an EV, but I do want to leave the options open. My brother has a Tesla Model Y Performance, and I drive EVs on the channel, so it's good to have options, and the NEMA 1450 plug gives me options. It was installed by the Watt Wizard. He came all the way down to visit me today, but he resides in the Magic Valley. So if you or a loved one are in the area, check him out. He's a master electrician, he's licensed and insured. He knows what he's doing, and he gives affordable prices. So I'll link him below if you're interested. Otherwise, let's time travel back. And now that we're back, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching my video. Thanks for hearing my gripes, my concerns about the platform. Again, I love it overall. It's a really good vehicle and for the foreseeable future I have one. But those are the concerns that are weighing on my mind and the things that I want to share with you. Either a potential future buyer or current owner, whatever that may be. If you like my video, please consider giving it a big thumbs up. Your act of kindness really goes a long way. It helps the video get shared and it just shows me that you appreciate this style of video, this style of content. Otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Take care until the next one.